Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're listening to House of Cards. Today, the game is different. I want to gamble. Gambling is a very serious business. Is that clear? Welcome to House of Cards. Dave Weishato with you here, deep from the swamps of Jersey. Got a great show coming up for you. Imagine not knowing anything about poker, yet setting out not only to learn the game, but to play in the main event of the World Series of Poker. That's what today's guest did. Best-selling author and psychologist Maria Konnikova not only learned the game of poker, but she developed the thinking skills to play in some of the biggest tournaments in the world and become a successful professional poker player. She wrote all about it in her incredible book, The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. And when we come back, we're going to hear all about it from the author herself, Maria Konnikova. So stick around. We'll be right back with House of Cards. Hey, this is Dave Weishuttle from House of Cards with your House of Cards gaming report for the week of February 26, 2024. Choctaw Casino and Resorts announced that Pro Football Hall of Fame and Dallas Cowboy legendary running back Emmett Smith is now part of the roster of celebrity athlete ambassadors. Smith joins his Cowboys teammate Troy Aikman along with Ivan Pudge Rodriguez and Darren Woodson as an ambassador to the casino as part of the Where Players Play marketing campaign. Smith's first commercial for the resort debuted during the Super Bowl. And if you want to experience more of the NFL, even though football season is over, head on over to Caesars Online. The company is offering a new Caesars football blackjack game. Caesars Entertainment is the only iCasino in the United States with rights to use NFL marks and logos. That blackjack game is live right now in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And finally, a man has been sentenced in one of his two cases in which authorities allege he went to two Minnesota casinos and played slots for gamblers who paid him to place those bets. Blake C. Fitzgerald pled guilty in court to a gross misdemeanor charge because not only did he play slots for the gamblers, he streamed it on TikTok. Fitzgerald was sentenced to two years of probation and fined $488. Probably shouldn't have put that evidence on social media. If any news or tips regarding casinos, gaming, or legislation, send us an email at newsroom at houseofcardsradio.com and follow us on X at HOC Radio. For more than 30 years, SCCG Management has set a standard of excellence unmatched in the global gaming industry. From startups to established companies, SCCG Management and its team of experienced leaders help each of their clients navigate the ever-changing, fast-moving business of gaming in all its forms. Sports betting, iGaming, eSports, casino technology, SCCG Management provides a global network to connect its clients with the right strategic partners for growth on a global scale. SCCG also works with entrepreneurs, providing capital and resources to assist in the development of new and innovative products and platforms. Whether you're looking to enter the U.S. market, expand your reach to other parts of the world, or establish your business in the global gaming industry, look to SCCG Management for the guidance you need. SCCGmanagement.com, expert solutions for strategic success. Wake up, poker fans! You're listening to House of Cards. House of Cards, Dave Weishaba with you. I am thrilled to talk to our next guest because she is the author of an amazing book. Maria Konnikova, who wasn't a poker player, set out to learn the game in order to play in the World Series of Poker. Along the way, she got help from one of the best poker players, played in some of the biggest tournaments in the world, and did extremely well. And Maria acquired skills that reached beyond the poker table. The book is called The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. And we are lucky to have the author Maria Konnikova on the line with us now. Maria, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for coming on. I, it's an absolutely incredible book, but I got to ask you, 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 I mean, you weren't a poker player to begin with. What made you choose the game of poker for this project? I was interested in the role of luck in life, and I wanted a way to explore that. You know, how, how do we figure out where our skill ends? How do we figure out where randomness begins? It's a really big question, and 
that's not it's not enough for a book i mean that's kind of a, a life a life <laughs> quest not a narrative so i was trying to figure out a way in and a way i could explore these topics and hopefully learn more about them and become a better decision maker and when someone one of my friends heard what i was thinking about they said well why don't you check out game theory if you're interested in chance if you're interested in this this type of framework then it's a really good way of looking at it and so i did um, my game theoretical background was decidedly limited at the time <laughs> and so i decided to pick up um, the theory of games which is the foundational text of game theory one of the authors john von neumann it turns out was a poker player and he wasn't just a poker player poker was the foundation of game theory. It was the inspiration for game theory. And the way that von Neumann wrote about the game made me really want to seek it out and figure out, well, what is this poker thing all about? There's this wonderful quote from him. Um, I think I'm going to, I think I'm getting it right, but uh, <laughs> I apologize if I'm misquoting him. Um, he says something like, real life consists of bluffing, of little tactics of deception, of figuring out what does this man think I mean to do? And that's what games are about in my theory. I read that and I thought, wow, this is this is really interesting. I want to learn more about this game. And so I did and something just clicked. I thought, this is the book. Why don't I learn poker and actually take up von Neumann's challenge? See if I can figure out how to use poker as a way into decision making in life, as a way of figuring out where my skill ends and the randomness of chance begins. Your examination between skill and luck was fascinating in the book. And and what you did, you took von Neumann's approach to it. What made you set your goal on the World Series of Poker? Yeah, um, you know, I didn't know anything about poker. And so I just tried to figure out, well, what's important in the poker world? And I very quickly figured out that the main event of the World Series of Poker was the event that poker players always looked forward to, that this was kind of the pinnacle. So it's kind of the equivalent, you know, if I if I decided to play tennis and I said, I'm going to play Wimbledon, it's the most important <laughs> one. Um, and obviously not quite the same because I don't think I'd be anywhere near Wimbledon basically ever, even if I devoted my entire life to tennis. Um, <laughs> luckily, poker has a slightly lower physical barrier to entry. I am not athletic. Um, I, I very much lack hand-eye coordination, so tennis is not in my future. Um, <laughs> well, but... at least you're sitting in poker, so that's a good thing. You're sitting down, so that's good. <laughs> This is true. This is true. And I can do other things. I do yoga. I used to dance when I was younger. But but I can't do anything that involves balls coming okay. anywhere <laughs> in the vicinity of my body, That especially at high speed, just tennis, golf. Well, golf, I guess it's going away, but I can never, I've never been able to hit a ball with a golf, golf club. Just that's, that's not my strength, but this is going to derail the interview. We don't have to talk about how bad I am at, at all sports that require hand-eye coordination. Those are five but of my next questions. What are you bad at? Those are my next five questions. What are you bad at? Well, you got it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I'm horrible at that. Um, but yeah, so I decided that this was symbolically going to be a really important thing. And of course, it didn't hurt that the person who I'd wanted to coach me and who ended up agreeing, I got incredibly lucky, talk about luck, was Eric Seidel. And Eric Seidel is someone who has multiple World Series of Poker bracelets. And the first time I'd ever seen him was in the movie Rounders, where he comes in second in the main yes. event of the World Series of Poker to Johnny Chan. And that was actually the only poker scene, real poker scene I'd ever seen in my life. Now, you, you brought up the question I was going to ask next. I mean, you actually got Eric Seidel to help you during this project. You know, I, I'm sure you got a million questions about how was he was a coach and what information did he give you? And it's it certainly outlined in the book, but I, I want to know from you, what do you think made him feel that you were a good student to take on? I think it was a combination of factors. First off, I wasn't a poker player, so he's never taken on any other students in his life. And I think it helped that it wasn't like a poker player approaching him and saying, Hey, Eric, I want some lessons, make me better. 
I was a total blank slate. I was somebody who had no experience whatsoever in the game. And I came from a completely different world. I had a background in psychology and writing, and he knew this. And so for him, it was a really interesting test of philosophy. Can someone who's not coming in as a stats whiz, who's not coming in with those brilliant mathematics that a lot of the young players these days are focusing on, can someone from a more traditional psychology background, but with a deeper understanding of psychology, can someone like that still succeed? Can that style of play still succeed? So I think for him, it was a very interesting test. And I think the other element, maybe even the more relevant one, was that Eric loves poker. He, I mean, he is passionate about the game more than most people I've met. I mean, he he and Phil Galfon probably contend for the two most passionate about poker people (laughs) who I've had the chance to get to know over the last few years. But he loves it for the right reasons. He thinks that he loves the process. He's not in it for the money. He's in it for the challenge. He's in it for the game. And I think he saw in me an opportunity to share that love with a wider audience, with people who weren't poker players. Because I was coming from The New Yorker. I was coming from books that had nothing to do with poker. My fan base, so to speak, such as it was, um, was very, very different from, from a poker player's. And so he thought, I think he thought several steps ahead and said, if I help her now, and if she actually is able to accomplish this, it's going to be good for the poker world several years from now. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. With costs going up, Adam and Eve is the best deal around. With 50% off a sexy adult product at adamandeve.com. That's 50% off right now when you point the camera on your smartphone at the code on the screen. Don't get up. Just open your camera and point it at the screen. Hurry. You'll also get 10 free gifts, including free discreet shipping at checkout. This is your chance to get more for less. So scan now for 50% off plus 10 free gifts from adamandeve.com. Drizzly makes it easy to shop a huge selection of beer, wine, and liquor from wherever I am. I just open the app, find what I want, and it's at my door in under 60 minutes. Drizzly. Ding dong, Drizzly. You're listening to the House of Cards. Knife. Knife. Not thrilling, but knife. Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaud with you. For those of you just joining us, I am talking with Maria Konnikova, author of The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. You know, I I was fascinated with your interaction with Eric in the book and his thoughts of a poker player sitting at the table. I mean, he compared it to being a jazz musician, which I thought was a fantastic analogy. Can you explain what he... Isn't that beautiful? I I never thought of it like that, and, and he's right. Can you explain what he was talking about when he made that comparison? Absolutely. I the first time he made the comparison, I it, it baffled me a little bit because I I was thinking of poker more as war, you know, <laughs> zero sum. I I'm out to get you and you're out to get me and we're going to go guns blazing. And he said no, it's it's really more like playing jazz because in jazz and it's it's specific, it's not musicians, it's jazz musicians because in jazz there's 
improvisation. And the musicians have to play together and react to each other and be so finely in tuned to each other that the improvisations work. They have to constantly adjust, constantly figure out what all the other players are doing and respond to that and play together so that the overall music works. And poker and Eric's style specifically, I mean, one of the things I've seen Eric do better than anyone else is adjust to other players. He is capable of anything. It just depends who he's playing with. He is in tune with all of the other musicians, and he will make his music sound different depending on where he's playing. And he, the other thing about jazz, which Eric pointed out, which I think is really important, is that there's no one style. And he said to be a great poker player. To be a good poker player, you can follow a strategy. To be a great poker player, you have to be a free thinker. You have to be someone who's willing to follow different paths, different strategies. And that's true of the greatest jazz musicians as well. You know, in reading your book, I mean, I thought about something in my life that had nothing to do with poker. As a young guy starting law school, everyone gave me the um, the idea that, you know what, you're not going to law school to learn the law because it's changing, it's fluid. You're going to law school to learn to think and analyze like a lawyer. And midway through the first year, from sheer repetition, something is going to click and you're going to analyze information efficiently. Should we think about poker like that? In order to play the game of poker, you have to think like a poker player? I think in order to play the game of poker, you have to not necessarily think like a poker player. You have to think correctly. Mm-hmm. I think not all poker players do that, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. And and I think that a lot of poker players are held back by what they're supposed to do as a poker player. One of the things that I think I had going for me is that I had no notion of what was accepted, of what was okay, and what wasn't. I had to just try to figure things out and see what was working, see what felt right. I was, uh, I had to be a free thinker the way that Eric had, had told me to be. I didn't know, you know, oh, no one bets big here. No one leads in this spot. No one does this. You always check to the free pre-flop raiser. There are so many quote unquote rules of how a poker player is supposed to act. And when you do something different, people say, oh, what a fish. I can't believe you're doing that. And yet oftentimes that's how new strategies are born. You know, the first time that someone overbet the turn, people said, what in the world are you doing? And now everyone's doing it because it ends up that it's solver approved and solver friendly. The first time someone probably bet you know, quarter pot or even a fifth pot on the flock, people said, what are you doing? That's such a tiny bet. That's a stupid bet. Um, And people are now doing it all the time because, again, solver approved. So there's always the, the people who think, wait, let me do something different, something that's not expected. But for me, there were no expectations. I wasn't thinking like a poker player. I was thinking through the process. And I think... What Eric taught me is there's never a right way to play a hand. There's never something you always do or that you never do. You have to consider all of the options always. And you have to be very mindful and very proactive about why you're choosing a particular line. It can't be default. It can't be, I always bet here. I always check here. I always do this here. I always raise with my flush draws. No. You have to figure out why you're doing it in this particular case and what all of the other options are. Because what if there's a better option out there? What if there's something that's actually going to have a better result? So he taught me to do that from the very beginning. And at the beginning, it was incredibly overwhelming. I wanted him to give me rules. I wanted him to tell me, you know, this is how you play this hand because I didn't know what I was doing. But over time, I'm so grateful to him that he never gave in, that he never actually told me how I was supposed to play a hand, but made me think it through step by step by myself every single time. Of course, he helped me. Mm -hmm. He helped me think through the options, but it was always a conversation. Did Eric fully embrace the nickname The Dragonfly? (laughs) I was curious. What a great nickname that is. (laughs) Well, the first time he saw it was when he read the book. (laughs) I didn't share it with him. (laughs) Yeah, there were were multiple things that I did not share with him until the book. Yeah, the the marketing possibilities for him are incredible. I think it's such a great nickname. Do you agree? I think it would be an amazing nickname. I can see it on shirts. It'd be perfect. Yes, the Dragonfly effect. 
absolutely. It's I'm, such a it's <laughs> such an amazing thing. I was so glad I discovered it. Yeah, right. Trademark that. <laughs> I should. I should. But I, I, I want to talk about your first steps into the poker world, which is always trying when you go into something new. Uh, you, you started learning in New Jersey online. Tell us about that. Why was that important to start online in New Jersey? Absolutely. Um, so when I began this journey, I always wanted to play live. I actually, I don't think I even realized that online poker existed. I don't I don't think I knew it was a thing because all the videos I'd seen on YouTube were live poker and it just it didn't even cross my mind. And so I was quite surprised when Eric said, "Okay, you're going to have to start playing online." And because I live in New York and online poker is not legal here, um but New Jersey's right across the river, so I 15 minutes later I can be somewhere where it's legal to play. He said, "This is how you're going to start because volume online poker lets you practice in a way that live live poker simply cannot. Online poker is faster. You can get experience. You can see what different situations feel like. And Eric was really anxious that I do that and that I try to get in as much experience as possible before I hit the quote-unquote real poker tables. I say quote-unquote because to me it's real, but I realize that to online players, the online poker is much more real (laughs) than live poker, and they see live poker players as fish for them, um, which may or may not be true. But I decided, okay, well, I didn't decide. I said, I at that point was doing anything that Eric told me to do because he was my coach and I was taking this training incredibly seriously. So I decided, okay, every day I'm going to go to New Jersey and I'm going to play. And what I would do was play mini tournaments. Um, Eric was also insistent that I play with real money from the beginning because people don't play the same with fake money. Um, You need a real stake in something. He also made sure that I was, from the very, very first time I played, very conscious of bankroll. So I was playing tiny tournaments, you know, $5 tournaments. The most expensive tournament I played was a $10 tournament, just to make sure that I wasn't just firing these crazy things that I had no way of beating and that I could organically make my way up from the smallest stakes. And by the way, um, it was only tournaments. He told me right away I had to specialize because I had a limited amount of time. And while both cash games and tournaments were no limit hold'em, they were quite different. And he was going to teach me only one. And so we, we focused on tournaments. And then I would record it. That's actually the other wonderful thing about online poker. You can record your screen. So I would record my sessions and then Eric and I would review hands. He'd actually be able to see mistakes I was making, see how I was playing, see what I needed to work on, see how I was evolving. Had I started live, I wouldn't have been able to do that simply because I didn't know what I was supposed to pay attention to. And I was so overwhelmed because I was just starting out and I didn't even know what what hands I was supposed to be playing. So I was really starting from scratch. I would have been so overwhelmed that I wouldn't have been able to narrate the hands in a way that would have been helpful to him. And in fact, that's what happened when I finally got to Vegas. I found it very, very difficult to relate hand histories at the beginning. Well, that that's my next question. What were your first impressions of the card tables in Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> my first impressions of Vegas were... Um, not ideal. Yes, <laughs> I'm yes. not a not a Vegas fan. And the first uh, poker table I ever sat at, um, courtesy of Eric, who said, "You need to see the real Vegas. We're going off strip. Boy, did You're you going ever. to play the daily turn." <laughs> yeah, he he took me to the Golden Nugget. Yep. He didn't actually go himself. He he went back to the Aria. He just <laughs> dropped me off at the Golden Nugget and said, "Have have fun," because he wanted me to see the real Vegas. And so that was my first ever poker tournament, actual real poker tournament, Mm -hmm. was at the Golden Nugget. And I was not impressed. Um, not, I don't, I don't want to say anything bad about the Golden Nugget, but it was not a great group of people. Um, people were drunk. People were not taking anything seriously. I, I saw an angle shooter. There was an angle shooter at my first ever poker tournament. Um, and I 
was actually able to spot that because my last book was on con artists and I'd read about angle shooters and I thought, oh my God, I can't believe this actually exists and this is happening. And had I not seen the contrast, had I not seen that the Eric's of the world were possible, and he also, when I got to Vegas, he introduced me to all of his friends. Um, I actually had a chance to watch the high rollers as they unfolded at the Aria. And so I saw what was possible. I saw what minds there were in the game. I saw what I was aspiring to. And so that kept me going and that motivated me. Had I only seen this golden nugget situation, I might have turned right around and gone back to New York. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. Sign up at jackpot.com and you can bet on the world's best lotteries where the biggest jackpots are up for grabs. Powerball, Mega Millions, some of the biggest lotteries can be found at jackpot.com. Simply choose your lotto game, pick your numbers, or use their quick pick feature, and you're done. Sign up at jackpot.com with code DRAW24 and get a free lottery ticket with your first deposit. Jackpot.com, it's the world of lotto in your hand. Terms and conditions apply. You must be at least 18 years old and in the United States to play. Void where prohibited. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Interest rates and inflation are out of control. Is your credit card debt also out of control? It's time to resolve your debt and take back control for a lot less than what you owe. If you have $10,000 or more in credit card debt, then you need to call us right now. Debt Fix Pros can significantly reduce the amount you owe, and you could be debt-free faster than you think. I knew we had to do something. Our debt was growing. It was getting out of control, and we just didn't know what to do. We saw an ad for Debt Fix Pros. We called and they showed us how fast they could get us out of debt. It really was amazing. And now we're back in control. Call now and we'll show you how easy it is to fix your debt. The call and consultation are free. Call Debt Fix Pros right now at 800-479-3522. That's 800-479-3522. 800-479-3522. With costs going up, Adam and Eve is the best deal around. With 50% off a sexy adult product at adamandeve.com. That's 50% off right now when you point the camera on your smartphone at the code on the screen. Don't get up. Just open your camera and point it at the screen. Hurry. You'll also get 10 free gifts, including free discreet shipping at checkout. This is your chance to get more for less. So scan now for 50% off plus 10 free gifts from adamandeve.com. Every 40 seconds, a kid is reported missing. Find the Children provides educational material that teaches your kids how to recognize and avoid predators. Our recovery programs are very successful in bringing kids back home to their family. You can help protect our kids and bring the missing kids home safe by donating your unwanted car, truck, SUV, or van. Running or not, We guarantee you will receive the maximum tax deduction. We provide fast free pickup usually within 24 hours. Over 2,000 kids are reported missing every day. Call now to donate your vehicle. Donate now to bring this kids home safe. Call 800-934-2260. 800-934-2260. 800-934-2260. You're listening to House of Cards. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaddle with you. For those of you just joining us, I am talking with Maria Konnikova, author of The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Is any time during this process, did you think to yourself, boy, is this worth it? <laughs> yeah, many times. Yeah. Many times. I mean, there were there were a lot of times when I thought, 
whoa, what am I doing here? Yeah. You know, why why am I doing this? I, I mean, I knew why. I knew I was writing a book. But there were there were definitely low moments. And especially at the beginning, um, I was in Vegas on and off for about two months. And that's how long it took for me to actually start making money. So I was firing lots of these daily tournaments. Once again, bankroll management, I wanted to play in the Aria daily, um, which I think was 120 or $140. I don't remember. And Eric didn't let me. He said it was way too expensive for me and I wasn't ready for it. And I was very upset with him, but he was right. Because if you're firing lots and lots of daily tournaments, that adds up really quickly. And even a $35 tournament becomes very, very expensive. So it took me about two months before I actually won one of those. And it those two months weren't great in the sense of not seeing any results. I was working really, really hard. I was studying all the time. I was trying my best, and I just nothing seemed to click. And it, t- it took a while. But then when things came together, at that point, I said, I'm going to do this. This is, yes, I can do this. Um, and then I never looked back after that. In your book, you have a section that I think every poker player should memorize. You call it the art of losing. I mean, you say that every poker, if they lose, uh, probably when they lose, they should lose constructively <laughs> and productively. What does that mean? And how should a beginning poker player know how to lose? When I first met Dan Harrington, who was a mentor of Eric's and who wrote the books that started off my my learning career in poker, Harrington on Hold'em, he told me something really important that I've carried with me throughout this entire time. I was complaining to him, I think, a little bit and saying, oh, you know, I'm, I haven't been doing well. And he said, good. And I was very surprised by that. And he said, if you get lucky early on in your career, if you start doing well right away, you're never going to learn because you don't yet have the cognitive tools to figure out whether you're actually good or whether you got lucky. You can't figure out if your decisions were good or not. Failure on the other side of things, failure actually forces you to examine your decision process. It forces you to think, okay, am I doing something wrong or am I on the bad side of variance? It forces you to ask those questions. It forces you to actually go back and examine what's going on in a way that success doesn't. And I think that's very true in life too. People who are getting lucky when things are going well, you don't really question it. You say, yeah, I'm really good. And when things aren't going well, that's what makes you start questioning things. And that's, I mean, it's funny, that's what prompted the book, things weren't going well. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize just how powerful luck is and how much of a role it has in how our lives unfold. And failing at poker, it forces you to really make sure that you're actually making good decisions in a way that succeeding at poker doesn't. And so some players, the players who I think go on these sun runs very early on tend to be the same players who then burn through their bankroll and are never heard of again. You know, I love that you had the Kipling quote in there. If you can meet with triumph and the disaster (laughs) and treat those two imposters just the same. I think that what a great mindset for beginning poker player, how to handle the ups and the downs. Is that how a poker player should focus on winning and losing? Because let me tell you something, talking to a lot of poker players, they all love their bad beat stories. Boy, they just they can't <laughs> wait to tell me about oh. them. But uh, is that the way they should be thinking about poker? Yes. Yes. I mean, one thing that Eric taught me very early on is that it's all about the process. The outcome just does not matter. You can't think about it. You can't dwell on it. This this goes to bad beat stories too. You have to focus on the decisions. Am I thinking correctly? Am I making the right decisions? Am I focused on the right information? Am I using the right factors to make my decision? And if not, what should I change? How should I do this? And once again, disaster is what teaches you to go to go there and to actually go through that mental process. Otherwise, it's just too easy to conflate the two. And 
the first time I tried to tell Eric a bad beat story, he cut me off. He doesn't even know. He didn't know what had actually happened until he read my book because I relayed the hand <laughs> that was supposed to be my bad beat story. And he just shut me up. He said, I don't want to hear it. And I never want you to tell me a bad beat story ever. And I never have because it's such important advice. If you're focused on the bad beats, you're not thinking correctly. You're not focused on the right things. It's dragging you down mentally. The way that Eric phrased it is it's like putting your trash on somebody else's lawn or dumping your trash on somebody else's lawn. That's so accurate. But it's also carrying that trash with you because it's toxic. It poisons your mind. You're dwelling on things that you cannot control. The outcome, a bad beat means you you made the right decision because it's only a bad beat if you got your money in as a favorite. Um, If you didn't get your money in as a favorite, then it wasn't a bad beat and you were actually just, you know, unlucky in, in, in some other way, maybe, you know, flopped set over set and whatever that is um, or whatever the story is. But the true bad beat story is I got money in as a favorite and then he sucked down on me. That means he made the right decision. So just ignore that. And he told me, I never want to hear the outcome of a hand. Let's just make a pact. I don't care if you won or lost. I don't care what the other guy had unless we're going to be talking about him again. And the cards that he held are going to be important information for a future decision. I don't care about that. All I care about are the decision nodes the moments where you had to make a choice. Do you have questions about the hand? Do you have questions about the thought process? If you do, let's talk about it. If not, move on. You know, another fascinating part about your book was how you handled tells. I mean, I I figured you have a background in psychology. You're going to knock this out of the park. And it was a very interesting process you went through with regard to tells. And more importantly, that you didn't give away information to other poker players at the table. Uh, Tell us about that. How important was that in your development in your poker playing? Well, at the beginning, I was obviously a tell box because I was nervous. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what was going on. And my hands would shake when I had really good hands and I couldn't control it. And I thought, oh, whoa, (laughs) this is this is bad. And then when the nerves subsided a little, when I became more comfortable, I think that I was able to, a lot of those things just went away naturally. And other things I just, I could work on, I could focus on. But one of the things that I knew coming in from my work in psychology, because my last book was about con artists, so I had learned a lot and studied a lot about deception, was that this was going to be much harder than people thought. Most people are really, really bad at spotting deception. And by most people, I should actually say people in general. It's like 99% of people are horrible at spotting deception. And we're, we're just no better than chance. It's a 50-50 shot, whether we can tell if someone is lying. If, of course, this person is a good liar. If someone's bad if they're, or if they're nervous like I am, then, then you'll be able to see. But the good liars, the con artists or the great poker players, you're never going to be able to spot something, especially not in the face, because humans are really, really good at controlling their faces. We have to. We do it all the time in order to be functioning members of society so that not every single one of our emotions is expressed on our face every single in every single social interaction. That, that would be fun yeah. if you couldn't actually control your emotions <laughs> when you were talking to someone. Um, so I knew it was going to be tough. You know, but it was something that I also wanted to work on. Go yeah, ahead. One of the things I, I was fascinated with, and you know, you always hear the term poker face. Actually, you know, it, you get more information looking at the hands, which I learned from your book. I that's, mean, that's what I learned, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think I came up with uh, the term. I'm not sure if anyone's used it before, but the term that I think I came up with, or at least used in the book, is poker hands. So a lot of people won't look at that part of the body, but it turns out that we actually give off a lot more information from our hands than any other body part. And I think that's true for a few reasons. One, we don't pay attention to our hands nearly as much as we do to our faces. We just don't think about them. Second, our hands show physiological signs. You can see the pulse. You can see if someone's sweating. There's a lot going on there. Third, we use our hands all the time in poker. We're betting. We're checking cards. We're sliding chips into the pot. We're checking. There's so many things that we're doing with our hands, and it's really, really difficult to do it 
the exact same way every single time. And it turns out that how you do these things reveals a lot of information about whether or not you have a strong hand, even so much that someone who has no idea how to play poker can tell who's strong and who's just pretending to be strong with better than chance accuracy. So now you have the dragonfly effect and poker hands. Boy, you're just coming up with incredible (laughs) marketing tools for poker. It's great. But but let me ask you something. Uh, Poker is a male-dominated environment. How difficult was it entering the poker world as a female player? At the beginning, it was quite tough. I was prepared for it a little bit because Eric had warned me. And he'd actually said, you know, I'm not sure how I would feel about my daughters going into this world because it's can be not great for women. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm a tough cookie. I'll be fine. Don't you worry about me. <laughs> um, and it turns out that it was much harder than I thought. I mean, poker's 97% male, give or take. That's a lot. And I did, especially at those early stakes, especially when I was playing those dailies and nightlies, where people weren't serious poker players, where they were there to have fun, where they didn't want to have to watch what they were saying and how they were acting and what they were doing. They were there to drink and to socialize and to gamble. For them, poker was gambling. And it's so funny. I just... I yell, I want to yell this from the rooftops, that poker is not gambling. It's a skill game. Stop calling it gambling. I'm not a gambler. I'm a poker player. And yet, for some people who have no understanding of the game and no desire to understand the game, it's the same as blackjack. They're just there to gamble. And there were a lot of those people at those smaller buy-in tournaments. And I experienced a lot of sexism. I experienced a lot of really unpleasant situations. I was called everything under the sun. I was propositioned. I mean, so many nasty things happened. And there was a part of me that thought, wow, this is awful. But there was another part of me that was a journalist and saying, okay, this is going to be great for the book. And there was a third part of me that knew that the Eric's of the world were out there. And by that point, I'd already become friendly with Phil Galifond, with Ike Haxton, with Jason Kuhn, with Dan Smith, with all of these wonderful players who are exceptionally bright, exceptional people, good people, great human beings. And they were all supporting me. And I knew that was possible. And so that kept me going. And then eventually, I was able to work on this and figure out, okay, you know what? Rather than letting this get to me, how do I flip the tables? How do I use it to my advantage? How can I use their sexism to my advantage? How can I use the fact that they underestimate me to my advantage? And when I started realizing that I could do that, that's when I started having much better results. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. Attention. If you owe back taxes to the IRS, watch this urgent message. The IRS is cracking down by hiring 87,000 new agents to garnish your paycheck and put liens on homes and businesses. They can even seize your bank account. The IRS calls it enforced compliance, and now they have the manpower to get you. Penalties and interest on unpaid taxes compound daily. So call One Stop Tax Relief Shop and get the IRS off your back. They're experts in the Fresh Start Initiative, one of the biggest breaks the IRS has ever offered. And no other tax shop gets you more or faster approvals. One Stop Tax Relief has resolved thousands of cases since 2014 and saved clients millions of dollars. Call now for a free consultation. Connect with tax professionals who get the IRS off your back. Call 800 800-605-0688. 800-605-0688. You're listening to House of Cards. Check out our website at houseofcardsradio.com. Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaddle with you. For those of you just joining us, I am talking with Maria Konnikova, author of The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. 
You know, you mentioned all these great poker players, and they're such unique characters, but is there a personality trait that they all have to make them successful? I, I know they seem to all love make prop bets and play the game yeah. Logan, Logan <laughs> things in their free time, but is there a talent that they all possess? I think they all love the game. They're all passionate about it for the right reasons. They're excited about the thought process. They're excited about the challenge. They're excited about thinking. They like that. I don't think any one of those guys is in it just to become rich. I I think that people who are motivated just by the money, they don't rise to that level. And maybe one of them is going to text me after they hear this and say, actually, I'm in it only for the money. Um, But as far as I can tell, they all truly love the game. And it shows and it makes them learn. It makes them study more effectively. They're motivated intrinsically rather than extrinsically, which is very, very important in terms of learning. And they're constantly evolving. They're willing to change. They're willing to take in new information and new styles because it's interesting to them. They're not dogmatic. They're not people who think, you know what, this is this is the way that poker is supposed to be. And I think that that's what unites all of them. Talk to me about the physical aspect of playing poker. I mean, reading about you being in all these tournaments, I mean, that's a physical grind. I mean, what kind of toll does that take on your body? And what did you do to maintain some, you know, the sleep process was, I guess, a big thing for poker players. I know everyone's talking about melatonin and other supplements to get to sleep. But what physically, what did you need to do to maintain yeah, it's, it's very demanding. Um, and I think when people say poker isn't a sport, they don't quite realize how physically demanding it is to play tournament poker when you're in multi-day events where you're sitting at the table for 12, 13, 14 hours a day, and then you have to wake up and do the exact same thing the next day, and you don't You can't not do it unless you want to blind out. It's not like a cash game where you can just suddenly walk away. And I I think that it's really, really important to take care of your body, and the best players do. I do yoga every morning. I meditate every morning um, when I'm traveling. I really watch what I eat um, and try to eat as clean a diet as possible. The first thing I ever do whenever I arrive in a new city is find the Whole Foods or whatever the grocery, you know, the organic market is closest to me and go shopping and actually buy things for the hotel room, buy things to Um, bring with me. If I can actually find a place with a kitchen, that's what I do so that I can cook and bring meals with me. It's so important to actually pay attention to all of those things because it's going to make you play better. It's going to make you better able to pay attention, to concentrate, to execute at your highest level. Otherwise, you'll soon find yourself playing your C game. And of course, some of the things are much more difficult it's difficult to sleep when there's a lot of adrenaline. It's difficult to sleep when you're jet lagged. So you have to just do your best and try to control as many variables as you can. Now, I don't want to give anything away in the book, but you did win the 2018 Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure, which is a national championship. And if this book was made into a movie, a director would probably stop the movie there. But you continued with your story yeah, in the I book. Would, yeah. <laughs> why do you, why do you feel the need to continue? I don't think, I think that that's, that's a cheat. That's a, that's a, it's not the right ending. That's just betraying the entire premise of the book, which is trying to figure out the difference between skill and luck. If I just end there, how do you know if I actually got good or if I just luck boxed my way into winning a tournament? I needed to keep going for myself to prove to myself that this wasn't a fluke. And had I never had another good result after that, I would have said, okay, well, I guess I got lucky. And so it was really important to me that I actually did end up making multiple final tables since then, that I have had second place finishes, no other big wins. But substan- I mean, I made more than half my career earnings after that win. And to me, that was crucially important because I was trying to tease apart the difference. That was the premise of the entire book. And sure, you have to get lucky to win a tournament, but did I also become skilled? And I needed to make sure that the second part was also true. How did the skills you learned from poker playing carry into your professional and personal life? Every single day, I've become a much better decision maker. I've become a much better thinker. I'm much better able to evaluate probabilities to see what probabilities are like. That's the type of thing that you expect from poker players. I've become a stronger person. 
better able to negotiate, better able to stand up for myself, I've become better able to regulate my emotions and to not tilt in real life and to actually pay attention to how I'm feeling so that I can discount it when I'm making decisions. All of these things I took from the world of poker. You know, we're Sorry, in a ver- I just dropped something. <laughs> no problem. I, you know, we're in a very strange time in the poker world when, uh, you know, poker rooms are just starting to reopen and others are still closed because of the pandemic. Now, the poker players, I mean, in the book, you showed that they're very hyper aware of their surroundings and very perceptive of what's going on around them. How do you think that this pandemic will affect the poker industry? Do you think some professionals won't come back to the tables or do you think they'll need some more time to get back to the rooms? Or how do you think this will affect the uh, poker industry? I think I think it depends on the person. Um, I personally am not heading anywhere in the direction of a casino until there's a vaccine and very good medicine. And I think it's irresponsible to to be in a casino right now. I think people who are, I, to be perfectly honest, I think it's very irresponsible of the casinos to be opening yeah. up, period, but especially poker. Poker is literally used by epidemiologists to look at how disease spreads. And plexiglass barriers ain't going to cut it because you're touching the same cards, you're touching the same chips, you're sitting in the same place for hours and hours and hours at a time. And we know that length of exposure matters. And people are drinking, which means that their masks are coming off. If their masks were on 100% of the time, every single person, maybe. That's not happening. If you look at people at the poker table, there's always one person, their mask is off. It's not on their nose. It's not on their mouth. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're taking a selfie, which just renders the whole thing absolutely moot. I feel very strongly about this, and I don't think there should be any live poker right now absolutely. in the U.S. period. No, absolutely. Maria, we're running out of time, but I want you to tell everybody how they can get a copy of The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. They can get it wherever books are sold. Okay. So obviously, all the usual culprits, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, but we're in the middle of a pandemic, yep. so please support your local businesses and try to get it from a local bookstore. Um, they would love to order it for you, and that will help them stay open during this very difficult time. But if you can't, and if you go with Amazon, I'm just very grateful that you order the book from anywhere that's convenient for you. Her name is Maria Konnikova, and the book is The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. It's an absolutely amazing book, and thank you, Maria, for coming on and telling us all about it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a really interesting conversation. Well, that'll do it for us this week. I'll see you next time on House of Cards. Across the desert